Well, it's taken 20 years of applying. And finally, on my 20th year, I drew the Henry Mountains bison tag. Yeah, it's an archery tag, not a rifle tag, but quite honestly, it doesn't matter to me. I've been dreaming of hunting free range bison in the Henry Mountains for years and years and years. And here's why. The Henry's herd was reintroduced from Yellowstone National Park. It was brought, I think in the 1940s, and put down in the lowlands. They thought that the bison were gonna live down in the low country. The bison had other ideas. They said, we're going up to the top of the Henry's to nine, 10, and 11,000 feet. And that's where they took up residency. In America, bison and our conservation history are absolutely intertwined. And when I think about the groups, the people who said, I'm gonna do something about this. And for those of us living today, it seems so nebulous, so intangible to think about people saying, we're gonna do something for wildlife. We're gonna have conservation laws. We're gonna advocate for wild places, wild things, which became advocacy for clean air and clean water and public lands and all the things we take for granted today. If you follow their trail back to where it all started, it all started with the depletion of the bison herds in the 1870s and the Boone and Crockett Club and its influential members coming forward and saying, America will have a conservation ethic. And we were fortunate that one of the founders of that organization became president of the United States in 1901. A lot of people, uh, especially hunters, should understand how fortunate we are that we had a hunting conservation president like Theodore Roosevelt. In the history of how he became president and how he got to use the bully pulpit to take this feeling of conservation loss that is exemplified or expressed in the story of the American bison and take that and use it as a mechanism for change in a country when he became president is an amazing story. Roosevelt lived through this period where it went from just immense abundance to complete scarcity. And that affected him in a way that when he became president, he was the person who stood up and said, we will not skin this land for those yet unborn. And all of that comes back to bison. That's why today to get to hunt bison is such a remarkable thing. I suspect those people in 1850, in the period when Roosevelt was born, in that generation, they could not imagine a depletion of a resource as immense as the bison herds of North America. But yet within one generation, they were gone. And I think about that. Today we say, oh, it's the good old days for elk, or it's the good old days for turkey, or we have more white-tailed deer, or we have so much waterfall. Well, it, the lesson of the bison is it can disappear. The good old days can become the bad old days if they don't have eyes, ears, advocates speaking for them. If there are not hunters advocating for wild places and wild things, the wild things and the wild places will go away. Another fun part about all my hunts, especially this one, is the fact that we try to invite other people to join us. And in this case, J.R. Young, who's been on our podcast before, and Ray White, uh, I've known Ray through our Hunt Talk Forum. It's a big Western hunting forum. I've known Ray there for, boy, I can't remember how long, years and years. And Ray has been in multiple deployments overseas. And I invited him on this hunt. I said, hey, now that you're retired, you're back home, you want to come on a camp with us? And he lives in Colorado. I think it took him 
uh, three seconds to text me back and say, I'll be there. Here for a llama pickup. <clears throat> Bo Beatty and his wife Kirsten have a, a llama outfit here in uh, Capitol Reef, Utah. So we came down and we're picking up our llamas here in Utah. We're gonna use them and then we're gonna take them all the way back to Bo's place in Idaho. Come on, dudes. Out you go. Now, Marshall, he's the man. Yeah. You're the man, aren't you, Marshall? You want to be the first one in? We brought the llamas in, in the event that we shoot them down in one of these canyons or way up high on one of these ridges. It's going to be nice to have those llamas to pack it out. And it, I, I've shot a bison before. I had a Montana free range bison tag. And they're huge. When they're laying on the ground, you have to ask yourself, Holy smokes, how am I going to get this thing out of here? Well, here we are in southern Utah. You may have heard in the news about the big flooding that happened in Arizona in the last few days. Well, same thing hit here in southern Utah. The roads we were supposed to take to get into our campground, you can't get in from the west. It's washed out. I got a text from the BLM guy. The place coming in from the east, our buddy J.R. Young just went around and tried to do that. I got an in-reach message and it said, can't get in that way. So I'm not sure how we're going to get in. So when I got this text from J.R. of what route was the only remaining route, I'm like, oh no, because <laughs> The locals had told me the last route you'd ever want to take is this one from the north. It's so steep and such switchback. I'm like, oh great. I gotta do this in the pitch dark. I've got to do it with all these llamas, all this weight. Whew. This is not gonna be fun. And Nissan, you sent me this new Titan and said, test it out and see how it works. Well. In my mind, I'm thinking we're going to have a serious test here. JR himself. How's that for you? I don't want to do that again. So once we got there and got camp set up, JR was there. Ray was there. They were all set up. We just said, all right, let, let's get unloaded. Let's stake out the llamas. Let's get our camp set up and grab a meal. And we'll discuss everything in the morning. I, I'm, I'm wore out. I, I need some sleep. And so I, I don't know if I put my head on my pillow for a minute or a second, but I don't remember anything about going to bed that night. I was that tired. Well, 20 years in the waiting, opening morning of Henry Mountain Bison Tag. Can't believe it, actually. Never thought I'd draw, but I did. And now we're gonna jump in our rigs and drive up. JR, Ray are gonna show me where they almost got run over in a stampede last night before it got dark. And we're gonna get even with one of those bison. We wake up that first morning and I'm asking JR, all right, how far is it to where you said you saw those just before dark last night? Oh, we gotta backtrack and go up. So we all jump in our rigs and we pull up to this very first spot. And JR says, well, they were right up there. Oh, oh there they are. Well, we came driving up the road here. There's some guys parked right there that are glassing. So we thought, I wonder what they're glassing at. We look, and there's a small herd of 10, might have one bull in it, 
uh, mostly cows and calves. Another herd of cows and calves way over there. And then two bulls right up just under the crest of the ridge. So I don't know if everybody thinks you just glass these and that's how you kill them, but I'm inclined to load up my truck and drive as far as the trail goes, gain some elevation and side hill across there and go put an arrow on one of those two big bulls. You got a different plan, JR? It's pretty much how you do it. Yeah. You're not going to kill a buffalo sitting here and watching them. I'm trying to figure that out. Everybody's just looking. Maybe they're See, waiting for them to come lower. It's it's the, it's the first day, and I think people are there. I don't think they're that inclined to. I'm absolutely to, inclined to get after I'm, to get after it. I am highly motivated. I have llamas that I've drawn, and that's what everybody else doesn't have. All right. So they want them to come way down here in a pasture or something that mm -hmm. they can back up to them. Mm -hmm. I'll go shoot one up there. It's so steep up there. I think if he expired, he might roll a couple hundred feet down the hill. You might get that benefit too. Or we could start him on a roll down the hill. I don't know what the billionaires of the world are doing today, but they gotta be having a shitty day compared to me. I am in the Henry Mountain and I'm gonna walk up this hill for the next two hours, dreaming about putting an arrow in a bison. So, we've been glassing these bison. We went and parked our trucks, starting to get our packs ready. Got my bow on my pack, and some like uh, two guys on an ATV came flying by us, <laughs> parked right around the corner, and started up the hill because they saw we were getting ready to go up here. Well, they're just up here ahead of us. We're making time on them. They have a, a bison decoy, and I was gonna ask them, you know, where are you going? I'll go a different direction. Then. Well, there's another hunter even above them. So there are three guys stocking these same bison. Here goes the hurry. Hey, Ronnie. This is going to be tough way tougher than I expected. And so I, I told the guys, you know, let's just gather up, let's head back down off the hill, down to the trucks. Let's go loop way back around where we were in the morning, get back to that glassing spot. You can see so far. I mean, you can see everywhere. We're, I don't know, maybe a half hour we're there. And JR comes, he's like, hey, there's a group of bison right over here, just to the north of us. Marcus running the camera. We're gonna go over here, catch his spine, and try to get up and see where they're bedded and see if we can make a play on them. If we gotta come all the way down here. I don't know what the wind's doing over there, but we glassed them on this bench from about a mile and a half over there. And now we're only about, I don't know, seven, eight hundred yards away. So. I think I'm gonna do that. I'm just gonna catch that ridge, use that profile to hide me. Mm -hmm. And when I get up there to the trees, see where they're at. And maybe there aren't any bulls there, I don't know. But maybe it's all bulls. And maybe it's all bulls. That would be great.
man, as quick as we get to that first knob, we start dropping down that side. It's like, whoa, there's a bison walking up out of there. And I'm looking, yeah, it's a cow. Okay, here comes another one. Looking, oh yeah, it's a cow. And we stand there, and pretty soon there are five bison. One of them is a very nice bull. So Marcus and I just kind of stood there waiting. And while we're waiting, they're milling around, they're rolling around, they're feeding. I think we covered another 75 or 80 yards and we're getting down there now. We're, we're to where the saddle is almost at its bottom and the, the bison are up here. And so when I'm watching them, I'm waiting for the bison to get out of view and we'd move a few feet. And usually you could only move a couple feet to get to another tree and then you'd see where, okay, if I cross this gap, that bison's gonna see me. And we're just making it a few feet at a time, a few feet at a time. And we start making it, we get to the next tree, and as quick as we step out again, another cow has come out that I hadn't seen, and she's locked in on us. Well, she takes off. All the other bison except the bull, they take off. And I'm watching them, cow, 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 cow. And I'm like, where's the bull? Go walking over there and the bull comes probably 30, 45 seconds later, he comes out, but he takes off around the left side or what would be the east side of the mountain. I told Marcus, let's go this way. I, I have no idea what's on the other side. Let's go this way, see if we can cut him off. Well, we go that side and it's just this steep, absolute terrible rock slides and just, it's not pretty. And I'm in a hurry. I'm thinking, oh, I'll get across this real quick. It's quick. It's this great big flat rock. Oh man, my shoulder was killing me. At that point, it's like, you know what, let's just give it up. And so we backtrack and follow where they went and we get up high and we can see them moving way off, probably a mile and a half down here into this canyon land kind of country. It's like, so much for that opportunity. It'd really be helpful if we could catch a long bull. I don't know if we will, maybe that's just wishing against common sense, but it'd be good if we could. But I head back, the guys, JR and Ray and Dan are back there waiting for us, so. Ever since I drew this archery bison tag, a lot of people have asked me, what's your setup for bison? Well, pretty much what it is for elk. What you have here is a five millimeter full metal jacket, 11.3 uh, grains per inch. We're looking at a almost 29 inch arrow. Got a little bit of weight in the knock and the fletching. Then I have these 125 grain uh, bone broadhead. You see, they're just a they're just a two blade. But man, you talk about drive through stuff. So, the total arrow setup is pushing 500 grains. Better clarify that, someone will say, Newberg, you're saying you're shooting 500 feet per second? <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm, uh, I'm pulling 60 pounds, or slightly over, I guess on this new Bowtech realm. And with this arrow, I'm getting about 252 to 254 feet per second, which for how I hunt, what I do, I'm, uh, works exactly how my setup is supposed to work. So Marcus and I walk back and, and we gather up again with Ray and Dan and, and JR and 
I said, well, let's go back to that glassing spot and let's just keep glassing it. It's weird, you could drive your truck up to this knob and when you walked out, every direction you could see, just unbelievable. So we get over there and we look, there's two really big bulls, you can tell, and they're way up high, but they start coming down, just like those other two bulls from this morning. They're following almost the same path. So way up high, we've been watching these three bulls all day. Two of them are starting to move down, so we parked the truck down here. I'm gonna cut in right here, see if we can intercept them. There's this really flat bench, and he walks out to the edge of that bench, almost looks around, yeah, I think I'll just lay down here. And I saw him disappear, and I, I knew he'd lay down just by his body language of how he'd laid down. I'm like, you are kidding me. If he's still on that bench, we're gonna get underneath him, go straight to that bench, because the thermals, the heavy air is coming down here. We're gonna peek right up and he's gonna be right there at 20 yards. They're looking over there too, aren't they? Are they? So I'm getting ready because he's looking at us. The sun had now went behind the horizon. We'd lost the benefit of the sun being in his eyes. Looking from here, like they could literally probably come this side of the rock and go straight at them because it looks like that it drops off. Yeah, it does, but it must maybe a wind issue. Yep. That's it. It's blowing right that yeah, way. They're trying to say. Sure, that's what he's done. And he stands up. And when he stands up, his buddy comes walking over. And I range it, 51 yards. I'm like, oh, nah, I can't do that. And we were enough of a, 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 I guess, a threat or a worry that they start moving off to our left. And they go behind this little rock, pile of scree rock that I didn't want to be on. And I told Dan, I said, follow me.
we went around this way and the bison were coming this way and sure enough they come down and I range 43 yards. Oh yeah, and I come to full draw. I just was not going to take a chance on that shot for many reasons. One, I, I've done a ton of research about bison and how they respond to a hit, whether a rifle or a bow. And if you can hit them in the heart, everything's perfect. They're not gonna go very far. But if you hit them in the lungs, they're gonna go a long ways, all right? It's almost dark. If that bison, if I hit him in the lungs and he takes off running down through all these trees and canyons and say he runs for four or five minutes before he expires, that is a long distance he can go. I don't want that headache. I want to have the perfect shot. And so I passed. And I'm sure some people looked at it like, what are you waiting for, Newberg? But you know how it is where sometimes you just have that yep this is perfect whether it's with a rifle or a bow you're thinking i got this well, i didn't have that i got this feeling and so in it was a close encounter uh, the footage was great uh, my heart rate was beaten um, but the bison got away but that's all right it was for the first day to see that many bison and have a couple really cool stocks and get really close and have a shot that if things were better, I would have taken. Uh, I don't know that I could ask for much more on the first day of a place I've never been to. I'm hunting free range bison with a bow that are being pressured like crazy by other hunters. Uh, I, the, the, I, it exceeded my expectations for the first day by a mile. Well, I can barely lift my arm today after wiping out yesterday and just messing up my shoulder, but I fully intend that the adrenaline will allow me to draw back on a bison because today is hunting day two. And we've learned so much yesterday. JR and Ray and Marcus and Dan have all said we're going to go to school on what we learned yesterday. That's why we're not getting a super early start on it. What we learned yesterday is you just kind of lay back, let everyone else get it out of their system, and when the bison move off to go bed somewhere, then you go after them. That's how you do it. When we woke up the next morning, I, it was the, you could tell the weather was changing. It was. It, feeling like it was gonna you know, rain or snow or something. The wind was coming up, the temperature had dropped quite a bit, uh, a lot of cloud cover. So we drive back up to our, our glassing spot and we get there. And I don't know how long we'd been there, maybe 20 minutes and JR says, oh, there's a group of bison way up there to the northeast. That's one we might wanna move sooner rather than later on. Yeah, I think so. The road comes right up to them, up to that spit of acid. The road, they're right up above the road. I mean, yeah. they might even be within visibility of the road, I think. <laughs> um, Crazy. But we could come up around the corner and then figure out what the wind's doing up there. Unfortunately, it's coming out of the south from here, so it's a bad, bad angle right here. But yeah. up there's, you know, that's, that's a... I'm up for that. Let's go do it. All right. 
So we drive way up there, and yeah, unfortunately we get there, and the, there's not much private land up that high, but these bison happen to be on private. go back down to our glassing spot and we're watching where the guy from the night before had shot that bull and now he's got a bunch of helpers who are working their way up the mountain and we're watching on the skyline and there's this group of I think it was three guys walking on the skyline and there's four bison standing there looking at them I'm like dang it I guess I should have walked up there and offered to help that guy. Maybe I could have shot another bison. I have two of them up there. Bring the llamas up there. While I'm glassing those, Ray comes over and says, hey, what do you think we should do with those four bison? They're coming down the hill. And I'm looking, I'm like, those four are gonna do the same thing those two did last night. Let's go back, get in the same position. And when we do, when they get to that bench, this time I know exactly how to get in there. Maybe I'll get a shot. We got some bison coming down the same path. They stopped on the same little rock ledge they bedded on last night. We know the path they take, so we go see if we can intercept them. I don't know. Got a funky wind. Got vehicles. I think other people see them, but we're going to go see if we can be the first ones there. Dan and I start walking up there and we're trying to make good time because if they're getting fidgety, they're gonna cross this, this gully with these aspens in a hurry. So we're going and going, and Dan says, I think I see a bison. I'm like, where? He says, like 60 yards right up there. left the aspens are up in these pinions and we're in this pinion sage below them just stopping ranging it every time i'd stop and range it okay start thinking i'm gonna have a shot they'd start moving on
he's down. He is, he's gonna die right there. After all this running around, we go up into these quakies, and Dan says there he is, and so we have to side hill here, and they run down, and he's gonna, he's laid down from the shot, way over there, about 15 yards from the road. <laughs> I'll admit, it was exciting. It was exhilarating, it was satisfying, it was years of dreaming uh, of doing this. It, it was the fulfillment of one of my most desired hunting dreams. Uh, hunting free range bison in the Henry Mountains, doing it with a bow was, I can't even tell you how, how gratifying and just how special and how lucky I feel, one, for the opportunity but two, that it even turned out the way it did. And the bull ended up dying about 15 yards from a road, of all things. He'd run way down this hill, across this little draw, and tried to go up and couldn't get up there. And the ironic part is we trailered llamas for, I don't know, how, however far, a long, long ways. And uh, now we weren't even gonna need them. Right there. Oh my gosh. Oh. Ah. Oh. It's gonna take a couple guys to lift that head up. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, thank you. One arrow. And my dream of taking a free range bison with a bow here in the Henry Mountains is now satisfied. Got a bunch of wonderful friends to thank for helping me. JR and Ray and Marcus and Dan. All the people who, when they found out I had the tag, so many people gave me information. Scott and Ben, all you guys. Can't thank you all enough. Unbelievable. I better get my tag and get it punched and we'll start taking care of the the rest of it. I, I wish I knew what to say. I'm so thankful. Public land. They're an amazing animal. They are amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Then it was a whole lot of work of getting that hide off, keeping the meat clean, front shoulder, back strap, hind quarter. That is a back strap, my friend. Baby got back strapped. I mean, every feasible part that you could keep the ribs, the fin, the, the stomach fat, the liver, kidneys, heart, tongue. I'm trying to remember what else. The, I mean, obviously, all the meats from the brisket to, the, to all of the, the hawks for, uh, I mean, a bison, every part on a bison is big enough that it can make a meal. So when we left, the only thing remaining of that bison was the spine. Well, folks, this was a, I don't know what, 1,200 or probably larger, 1,200 pound or larger animal. All that's left is this spine. We got the cape, we're gonna roll that up, the whole hide, getting all that tan. The ravens are gonna be mad at us. I still think about how lucky I am to, to get that chance. I always say I'm the luckiest guy in the world and I believe I am. That's, that bison hunt is proof of that. To get to share it with great people, uh, two of my camera crew, uh, Marcus and Dan, and then JR and Ray. Oh gosh, what a special time. I, I hope everybody gets to do it someday. Uh, 
And obviously for everyone to do it someday, we're gonna need more bison. We're gonna need more free range herds. Uh, but maybe someday that'll happen. Maybe there will be places. Maybe there will be solutions. Maybe we'll figure out how to not place all the burden and all the cost on the ag producer and the landowner. Um, I hope that we can do it for the sake of bison. Every time I think about this hunt, my mind will go back to bison. It'll go back to that bison and the fact that they are descendants of the bison that paid the ultimate price. Those bison. They are why we have the conservation story in America. Those bison are why we have this ethic of wild things and wild places and concern for wildlife in this country. And we've somehow found a way in this time of progress that we decided we're gonna make more space and more place for the wild things. In this case, wild North American bison.